Today we're going to be talking about a rare case in which a common pediatric complaint, a swollen eye, is a sign of an ophthalmic emergency requiring hospitalization and immediate medical attention. This seven-year-old girl named Irina was brought to the urgent care clinic by her mother. You are a third-year medical student doing your pediatrics rotation at the clinic where the attending physician asks you to perform the initial assessment of this patient. While you're taking the history, Irina's mother tells you that her daughter has been complaining of a headache just behind her forehead. She's also had a very stuffy nose and pain in her face that gets worse when she bends forward to tie her shoelaces. Her mother thinks this might be sinus pain because Irina's older brother once had a cold that caused him to describe a similar kind of pain. But when Irina's mother took him to the doctor, she remembers being told that her son had a virus and didn't need to take any medicine. Irina's mother has been raising her three children by herself and recently found work on the housekeeping staff of a new hotel. She was afraid to ask for time off to bring her daughter to the doctor, but when Irina woke up this morning with a swollen eye that hurt her when she tried to move it, her mother knew that Irina needed medical attention. When you examine her, you find that Irina has a fever and an elevated heart rate. You also notice soft tissue swelling and redness around her left eye. And when you look at Irina in profile, you notice that her left eye protrudes anteriorly from the orbit. You pull out a vision card to test her visual acuity, which is normal in both eyes. She's reluctant to move her eye because she tells you it's too painful, but with encouragement from her mother, she manages to move the eye in all directions. Her eyelid doesn't appear to be drooping, her pupils respond normally to light, and when you examine her eye with the ophthalmoscope, her red reflex is intact. When you present these findings to the attending physician, she tells you that as you generate a differential diagnosis for Irina, it will be important to consider orbital cellulitis as a possible cause of her symptoms. Although this is a rare cause of proptosis in children, it's important to rule it out because it's an ophthalmic emergency that can quickly threaten the patient's vision or even her life. The attending physician explains that as she sees the patient, she'll be attempting to differentiate between orbital cellulitis and a much more common and benign condition called preceptal cellulitis. The orbit or space surrounding the globe of the eye contains fat, extraocular muscles, and a valveless venous system that's continuous with the cavernous sinus. It's also crossed by the optic nerve and the central retinal artery. Anteriorly, the orbit is bordered by a connective tissue extension of the periosteum called the orbital septum, which projects in front of the orbit all the way into the upper and lower lid. Infections in the skin and soft tissues anterior to the orbital septum are called preceptal cellulitis. Because of the presence of the orbital septum, these preceptal infections don't usually spread into the orbit. In Irina's case, her sinus infection allowed bacteria a backdoor entry into the normally protected orbital space. The orbit is separated from the air-filled nasal sinuses only by the thin, bony structures of the skull. Irina's mother was probably correct that her initial symptoms of nasal congestion and sinus pain were caused by a viral infection. Irina's immune system detected the virus and attempted to deploy alternate immune pathways to eliminate it, but this led to inflammation and blockage of the normal sinus drainage pathways. The decreased mucociliary clearance that resulted meant that an important physical barrier which usually protects the host by preventing pathogen entry was less effective, and bacteria were able to colonize the sinuses. If Irina had seen a pediatrician at this point, she might have been diagnosed with bacterial sinusitis and treated with antibiotics. Rarely in children with bacterial sinusitis, the bacteria go on to invade through the paper-thin bones separating the sinuses from the orbit. This is how they were able to enter Irina's orbit, then persist and replicate there to cause her symptoms.
Once the bacteria have spread into the orbit, they can cause serious complications, including spreading to the adjacent veins, which can lead to cavernous sinus thrombosis and impaired cranial nerve function. This commonly presents as sixth nerve palsy, or dysfunction of the abducens nerve, which is responsible for contracting the lateral rectus muscle to abduct or turn out the eye. Severe edema or abscess formation can also put pressure on the optic nerve or the central retinal artery, causing loss of vision. Clinically, differentiating between orbital and preceptal cellulitis can be a challenge because both syndromes cause eye pain and eyelid swelling with erythema. But orbital cellulitis also causes swelling and inflammation of the extraocular muscles within the orbit, leading to proptosis and pain with eye movement. Because of Irina's symptoms and her history of a recent sinus infection, the attending physician in this case decides that she should be admitted to hospital. There, a CBC reveals an elevated white blood cell count, and Irina undergoes a CT scan, which shows generalized inflammation in the orbital tissues, including the medial rectus muscle on the left eye. Luckily, no abscesses are seen, so it's unlikely that surgical intervention will be necessary. Almost immediately after arriving at the hospital, Irina is started on two IV antibiotics, a third-generation cephalosporin and vancomycin. Her blood cultures later return positive for strep pneumo, gram-positive cocci, which grow in characteristic pairs or chains. After three days on IV antibiotics, Irina's pain and swelling are much improved and her white blood cell count normalizes. On day five, she goes home on oral antibiotics to complete a three-week course of treatment. The hospital gives Irina's mother time off to look after her daughter, and after 10 days, Irina returns to school and her mother is able to return to work.